The Bhagavad Gita is the triumph of the human spirit. So the human spirit triumphs even over separation, over sorrow, over even the joys and the highs of life. The Gita is all about our own awakening to our potential. And it's very, very important that we know what the relevance of the Gita is in modern day living. It is not a sop for the bereaved, as people think. Any time you are hit by sorrow or tragedy, you think of the Gita. In good times, you never think. But in fact, it is a prescription for life. It helps you through every aspect of life, particularly success, excellence. Today, the world demands excellence from us. So it's not enough, for instance, for Sehwag to score a century once and after that get out, uh, perform badly the next two matches. It's not enough to have a flash in the pan success and then fade into oblivion. It's not enough that a person of Zakir Hussain's caliber plays excellently one concert and after that is mediocre. What is important is that you come out every time you act, not just a performance, not just a concert, any time, whenever you contact the world, what should come out of you is excellence, is perfection. That's not what happens. Most of us, once in a blue moon, once in a lifetime, you come, we come out with superlative performance and after that, fade into insignificance. So that's not what is required. And the Western world is looking for the solution to this. The enigma of fluent performance is, is unknown. In the West, it's unknown even here. But where it is available is in our textbooks, is in our spiritual uh, heritage, is in the Bhagavad Gita. So when you get into the zone, the zone means when you come out with excellent performance, you need to think, and every one of us has come out with excellent performance. The dullest, the least endowed, the least talented among us has come out with fantastic performance once in a while. So all of us have experienced it. The point is, when is it that you come out with excellent performance? Or let's put it this way. When you come out with excellent performance, what are the traits? What is going on in your mind? What is it that you are anchored in? And when, in spite of your best efforts, when you need it most, when you're best prepared, like when you'd go and do an exam, somehow you yourself fail yourself. So at that time, what is it that comes in the way? What is the obstruction, is the question. And this answer is given by the Bhagavad Gita. Where they say, any time you clean drop thinking of yourself, any time you rise above personal considerations and embrace a higher perspective, that's when the best in you comes out. It doesn't matter whether you're physically tired. It doesn't matter whether you are emotionally drained, it doesn't matter whether, whatever the, the circumstances are. But at any moment in your life, you stop thinking of yourself and identify or align yourself with something higher, the best in you comes out. And then after it's all over, you yourself find it difficult to believe, was that me? Was that my performance? It's unbelievable. If this can happen once in a way, why can't you replicate it? Why can't you do it every time? Not only does it, it, not only do you come out with perfect action, but you feel a sense of fulfillment, you feel a sense of happiness, you feel a sense of well-being, calm, peace, when you don't think of yourself. And third, it is, at moments like this that you are able to tap into your potential and your general level of performance goes up with every moment that you come out with peak flow, performance. 
So therefore, now, the difference between what we are coming out with is so mediocre, so low, and what we are capable of, the difference is so great that what is expected of us, as the Prime Minister said recently, is not incremental growth, but exponential growth. Because if you come out with incremental growth, 2% growth, 3% growth on a base that is abominably low, it doesn't make any difference. But what you need is 300% growth, 6,000% growth. And then you really come into your own. So, for which you need to understand what is it that's going on within you. Somehow, you and I seem to be a combination of perfection and stupidity, of brilliance and idiotic behavior. Impossible combination, yet true. Isn't that so? Sometimes you yourself come out with such fabulous actions. And then at other times, almost immediately after that, you come out with the most degenerative, uh, nonsensical performance. And you find it difficult to believe that both are you. So what is it in you that comes out with perfection? What is it in you that comes out with mediocrity is the question for which you need to understand, who am I? You and I are a unique combination of spirit and matter. The spirit component in all of us is the same, is a constant. The spirit in you, in me, in Einstein, in Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, in Swami Ramatirtha, in Krishna, in Rama, Buddha, Christ, all is the same. So also in a criminal. Then what is the difference? The difference is in the matter components. The matter components consist of body, mind, intellect. But your body, mind and intellect is different from everybody else's body, mind and intellect. What is it that makes it different? What is it, what is the genetic code that determines what kind of body you have, what is the quality of emotions that run through your mind, what is the level of intelligence or lack of intelligence that goes on in your intellect is the question. And this question, this genetic code has been cracked by our ancient rishis many, many centuries ago. And this, one, when you understand it, you can change it. No other creature in the world can change it. I'm not talking about genetic code. I'm talking now about the three gunas, sattva, rajas, tamas. Each one of us is born with a certain mix of sattva, rajas, tamas. What we refer to as SRT code. Okay? It's something new you learned now. Just as in sport, in music, in business, Everyone looks for something new, something extraordinary. You, they look for you to better your previous performance. So also in the field of spirituality. So every day when you come, you're looking for something different, something new. Otherwise, you say same boring stuff. So something new now and for the next five days is this SRT code, Sattva Rajas Tamas code. This combination of sattva rajas tamas that you and I are born with, you don't necessarily have to die in the same proportion. You can change that. No other creature can change it. No dog can change it. No ant can change it. No lion can change it. Whatever the nature they're born with, they live through, bound by their nature, and they die exactly as they were born. But you and I, the human being, has this immense possibility, potential, to change it for the better or for the worse. That is the tragedy. And most of us use our ability to exercise this change, to bring about this change. Very often, we bring about the change in the negative, not in the positive. You know why? Because to change for the worse requires no effort. But to change for the better requires enormous effort. Even to make that one step forward, in fact, even to remain status quo, you need to put in effort. So, 
the three gunas are sattva sattva literally means purity rajas we literally means passion agitation disturbance turbulence of the mind which we all experience and tamas inertia indolence laziness semi comatose condition some of us are in total comatose condition tamas literally means sleep so now what happens is in the state of tamas tamas is also characterized by ignorance we're starting with the lowest because it's easier to understand in the state of tamas you are ignorant of anything better than just the pleasure that you get from inertia like every morning the whether you wake up with an alarm or without an alarm when you wake up all of us experience this what is it the tendency to remain in bed the the disinclination to get out what is that there is a pleasure in that that is the pleasure of tamas newton calls it the tendency of an object to remain in a state of inertia of state of motionlessness or movement to continue status quo in other words is tamas inertia so in other words if you are act all of us are acting it's not as if we are totally inactive but whatever be your condition whatever be your state whatever be your lifestyle there is a certain pleasure you get in maintaining status quo you don't want to change it even for the better so let's say there are three friends and all three friends work in the same and uh, organization they are almost the, the same level and they live in the same housing complex okay but their temperaments are completely different so one guy the tamasic individual is quite happy what they have to do is every morning they live very far off they have to take an auto rickshaw to the station they have to change two trains and then take a bus to their place of work so the tamasic person he has got so used to it and got so attached to it and got so when you approach him and say hey there's a possibility of a better job there's a possibility of your being able to live closer to your workplace there's a possibility of your earning more of whatever he'll say no i'm content i'm happy i don't want to change this is tamas so this contentment comes not from a higher vision or a higher perspective it comes out of ignorance you've heard the saying ignorance is bliss the other person they're all three friends the other person is constantly in a state of agitation every day when he gets has to change those two trains and commute to work he says this is ridiculous this is not the kind of life that i need to be living and i want more what do i want i want a car to commute to work and back i want a better home so that i don't need to uh, spend so much time traveling i want this this so there's he's consumed by the disease of more wanting more now in the process of wanting more he doesn't work out okay I, you don't get more by just wanting but just creating a lot of noise you have to deliver you have to contribute you have to deserve what you are aspiring for that he conveniently forgets this is rajas so you are in such a state of agitation the mind is so agitated that the intellect is unable to figure out how you are going to go around achieving the objects of desire that you have and therefore you are frustrated in life and the quality of action that you come out with is flawed must necessarily be flawed because it comes out of an agitated mind the tamasic person on the other hand he performs actions he works the, to the bare minimum just to keep his job going and the system is such that it carries along such people 
in spite of the fact that they're not really contributing to the organization. The third person, he's in a world of his own because he's got a higher vision, he's got a higher perspective, he's got, his mind is always on something higher. And therefore, he's a self-motivated person, he's highly driven, motivated to activity, but his mind is content with what he has because he's not looking at what he has or does not have. He's looking at perhaps um, contributing to the welfare of uh, the city or the nation or humanity. You know, he's got a much higher perspective. He's, he's totally uh, locked on to the higher and therefore because that higher gives him so much joy, so much fulfillment, he's indifferent to what he has or does not have. Is that clear? See, the difference is a sattvic person is content with what he has because he has knowledge of the higher. A rajasic person is in a state of discontent because his knowledge is partial. He has knowledge of the world, but not knowledge of anything beyond it. He has knowledge of himself and his wants and his desires and his needs. But he has, because he's so obsessed with himself, he has little concern for anybody else. Tamasic person, totally selfish. He couldn't care even for his wife and children, even if they are uh, suffering, he says, I'm happy. So his happiness, he is not agitated like the Rajasik person, but his happiness arises out of ignorance. And that is a terrible state to be in, because it's like a bomb that's sticking. Any moment his desires will spring, the desires are dormant. Any moment they'll spring into his conscious mind and then he's in trouble. So these are the three states. Sattva, Rajas, Tamas. When you are in the state of tamas, it's like being asleep. You're asleep to your potential, you're asleep to your talent, you're asleep to the world, you're, as you're definitely asleep to that which is beyond the world. In the state of rajas, there's partial awakening, you're aware of yourself, you're aware of your little environment, but that vision is very myopic, very restricted. And sattva is where you have a totality view of things. Now what is important is in the state of sattva, your mind is totally calm, your intellect is creative, is thinking clearly and therefore you come up with solutions and your body comes out with perfect action. Whatever it is that you do. See, you could be cooking a meal. You could be singing a song. You could be playing an instrument. You could be playing a game like cricket or tennis or squash. You could be swimming. Whatever it is that you do, if that action springs out of tamas, what comes out of you will be what is known as effortless excellence. Effortless because the mind is calm. Without your realizing, see what you need to understand is your basic nature is perfection. What obstructs this perfection from being manifest is desires, ego, selfishness, all of which cause agitations of the mind. So when the mind is agitated, the, the, there are aberrations and these aberrations come out as mediocrity and imperfection. So in the state of rajas, your mind is agitated, your intellect is um, handicapped and therefore whatever action the body performs is flawed. I'm sure each one of us knows that in spite of our best efforts, you plan, I'm going to do this, 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 this. At the end of the day you say, oh my God, I forgot the most important thing. Or in the process of working, you spilled ink on something, you did, you know, so many imperfections come on. That is rajas. Tamas is a state where there's total indifference, you don't care. You don't work. What little work you do is so 
is backed by total demotivation and apathy, so you might as well not work. And when somebody points out your faults, you say, this is the way I am, you take it or leave it. So, the tamas is said to be the state of avarana, where your talent, your abilities, your skills, your potential is completely shrouded, covered. What a waste. What a waste of brilliance and energy. Imagine if the one billion Indians that are there in this country, if every one of us operates out of our sattva, what a nation we'll create. We'd swamp the world with perfection. Uh, rajas is characterized by vikshepa because the desires spring up, sprout in our minds and that creates a lot of agitation. Distraction, agitation, aberrations. And tam uh, sattva is the state of unveiling. As your desires get quelled, as the agitations of the mind settle down, that brilliance which you are already carrying comes forth. The mission of every human being is to, in our lifetime, somehow or the other, eliminate the tamas, refine the rajas, and establish ourselves in sattva. And when you establish yourselves in sattva, what happens? You reach the state of gunatita, you go beyond the gunas, which is the state of realization. The tragedy is, is, you see, if a South American or a Taiwanese person or somebody is not aware of this and is not doing it, is, it's understandable because it's not in their culture. But if you and I as Indians with this in, invaluable heritage that we, are, that we have inherited, if we don't make an effort to establish ourselves in sattva, it is the, uh, the Upanishad calls it Mahati Vinashti. Nashti, loss. Vinashti, greatest of loss. Mahati Vinashti, supreme most greatest loss. He deliberately uses a term which is grammatically incorrect. It is incorrect grammatically to use two superlatives in one sentence, right? And yet he does it just to get across the, the idea that you are... You are uh, perpetrating the greatest, the supreme, most greatest loss by not tapping into, into your sattva. Every one of us has enough sattva to be used to get rid of the rajas and tamas. But that, I, I don't know what we are involved in. What, what detracts from this goal is number one, ignorance, tamas. Number two, petty involvement with ridiculous things which have no bearing on even our life. We ourselves understand. Take an audit of your thoughts and your activities that go on every day and you will come to the horrendous conclusion that what I have done every day of my life from birth until this moment has been a complete waste of time. Barring a few occasions where good sense prevails, the rest of the time is waste. So therefore, if you want to excel, if you want to get into the zone, if you want to come up with peak performance 24 by 7, you have to somehow find a way of establishing yourself in sattva. They say, rajas predominates in human beings, Sattva predominates in the gods in heaven and tamas predominates in the demons in hell. Okay? Now what they mean is there are no gods in heaven and demons in hell. What it means is uh, the vast majority of human beings are in the state of rajas predominantly. Very few people, they are called the brahmins of society, are predominantly sattvic. If you come across such a person, consider yourself lucky to have the privilege of interacting with such a person because then the, uh, you can pick up sattva, very rare individuals. And tamasic individuals are demonic. If you have the ill fortune of 
being in the company of a th predominantly tamasic person, you find it's a drain on your energies. Because he doesn't want to do anything, he wants demands from people all the time. He's got his own pattern of uh, how life should be led and he sticks to it, come what may, doesn't budge. Makes the whole world revolve around his unintelligent concepts. There's no way you can change such a person. You can only, when you come across such a person, all you have to do is titiksha, suffer silently. <laughs> There's no other way out. So, in the macrocosm, what they say is in the universe, when sattva prevails, there is birth, creation, srishti. Then, when um, there is maintenance, rajas comes up. And when tamas predominates, there is destruction. So the three processes in the 